V2 PTE Academy. We are providing online PTE coaching and monthly practice test. You can also stay connected with us. Facebook, Instagram and Telegram. For more information visit our WhatsApp on given number. Subscribe our YouTube channel and press the bell icon for more updates. But you can see from the relatively crooked and narrow streets of the city of Rome as they look from above today, you can see that again the city grew in a fairly ad hoc way as I mentioned. It wasn't planned all at once, it just grew up over time beginning in the 8th century BC. Now this is interesting because what we know about the Romans is when they left to their own devices and they could build the city from scratch, they didn't let it grow in an ad hoc way. They, they structured it in a very care, very methodical way. That was basically based on military strategy and military planning. The Romans, they couldn't have conquered the world without obviously having a masterful military enterprise. And they were everywhere. They went on their various campaigns, their various military campaigns. They would build, build camps, and these camps were always laid out in a very geometrical plan along a grid, usually square or rectangular. V2PT We are going to start Chapter 3 today. The chapter is on cave paintings. Who can tell us about cave paintings? The drawings are mostly of animals. Correct. The animals are mostly bison, horses, and deer. The most common themes in cave paintings are large wild animals such as bison, horses, aurochs, and deer. Anthropologist Abby Bruill interpreted the paintings as being hunting magic. That is to say, they were meant to increase the number of animals. Drawings of humans are rare and are usually schematic rather than the more naturalistic animal subjects. Who can guess when cave painting started? Prehistoric times? Yes, the paintings were made during the Upper Paleolithic, about 40,000 years ago. Let me ask you another question. Who drew the paintings? Artists? Good answer, but who were the artists? What were their positions? Tribal leaders? Close, but incorrect. The artists were believed to be respected elders or shamans. The main colors of the paintings were limited to yellow, brown, charcoal, red, hematite, and manganese oxide.
V2PT. The history of software is, of course, very, very new. Um, the, the whole IT industry is, is really only 67 years old, which is extraordinary. And to be so close to the, to the birth of a, a major new technology, a major new discipline, is quite remarkable given where we've got to in those 67 years. And, and the progression has been not so much a progression as a stampede um, because Moore's law, the, the um, rapid expansion in the power of computing and the rapid fall of the cost of computing and storage and communications has made it feasible for information technology to move into all sorts of areas of life that were never originally envisaged. What has happened is that there has been as I said, a stampede for people to pick the low-hanging fruit. And that is what's guided the development of, of software and information technology over the past decades and continues to do so, with a number of consequences that we will explore. V2PT. Many parents communicate and educate their children with two languages, probably because they both know more than one language or they come from different countries. Most of these parents think this can benefit their children's language learning, but actually kids will get confused when their parents use different languages from each other to describe the same subject. If one parent sticks to one language and the other one sticks to another, their children will not be confused anymore.
V2PT. But Aristotle says the reason we need rhetoric is we have to be able to use it. To use rhetoric influence the ramble. We try to get them to understand truth. Truth is suggest. It's different than rhetoric. Rhetoric is the dressing, is the body, right? Truth is the spirit, is the soul, is abstract. It doesn't have a body. It's not particular. If you want to get somebody to the truth, you might have to use some kind of tricks, right? Because most of people are not sound and can see the truth. That's what we think. Most people are rambles, really. Only the educated, be erudite, are actually capable of seeing the truth. If you want to get the general mass there, you may have to do a little bit. So Aristotle, that is rhetoric. Rhetoric is something that is used to influence people, right? And it's kind of mentally promised a logic. V2PT. Let's say if I'm asking which source you often use to get information, newspaper, radio, TV, and the survey shows 62% of the people chose internet. You might be thinking I am going to say how important the internet is or how quickly it has changed the world for a few years. But what if I tell you this survey is conducted on the website globeandmail.com? Our answer will be different because the people who did this survey on a website must be frequent users of internet. This sample is a biased sample, so we have to pay attention to how a survey is conducted.
V2PT. Today we're going to recount heroic tales of superhuman feats of strength, when in the face of disaster, some people are said to have summoned up incredible physical power to lift a car off of an accident victim, move giant rocks, or like Big John of Song, single-handedly hold up a collapsing beam to let the other miners escape. Are such stories true? There are many anecdotes supporting the idea. But we're going to take a fact-based look at whether or not it truly is possible for an adrenaline-charged person to temporarily gain massive strength. In proper terminology, such a temporary boost of physical power would be called hysterical strength. The stories are almost always in the form of one person lifting a car off of another. In each of these cases, some aspect of leverage or buoyancy probably played some role in reducing the magnitude of the feat to something more believable. And even lifting many cars by several inches still leaves most of its weight supported by the suspension springs. But our purpose today is not to debunk any of these specific stories. The majority of them are anecdotal, and interestingly, not repeatable. In many cases, the person who summoned the super strength later tried it again only to find that they couldn't do it. Basically, what we have is a respectably large body of anecdotal evidence that suggests that in times of crisis, danger, or fear, some people have the ability to temporarily exercise superhuman strength. V2PT. Um, but we can really thank the great exhibition of 1851 for giving us the world's premier taxi service. For it was going to this exhibition, uh, this fabulous exhibition of inventions from all around the four corners of the uh, empire, uh, that the visitors were appalled, dismayed and vexed by their journeys to this exhibition because the uh, cabbies of the day and their horse-drawn carts were absolutely terrible, could not find their way to this exhibition. And so, at great public outcry, the London authorities set up the Public Carriage Office, which is an uh, organisation that still exists, and you can take a short walk to Penton Street up the road. Uh, and this, this um, Public Carriage Office take, took on the responsibility of licensing all major uh, taxi drivers in London. All taxi drivers from 1851 onwards had to pass what is now known as the London Knowledge this phenomenal uh, knowledge of London. What is the London knowledge? It's the ability to remember the 25,000 streets, how they're all interconnected, and know all the main arterial roads in and out of London. Cabbies need to know all this, plus a 1,000 points of specific interest, cafes, bars, public offices. They need to know them all. 
as part of their training. V2PT So, what do we mean by well-being? Health, happiness, a sense of achievement and contentment. A state of mind and body where people can thrive. Well-being is not something that is purely limited to people who are facing extraordinary challenges in their lifestyle, health, or personal circumstances. Everybody here has a level of well-being. Music so often forms an intuitive part of our well-being management. Music to pick us up, music to calm us down, music to heal our sorrows. Our aim, at, through research, is to move from this level of intuitive application of music through to informed use in our communities, to take the next step in the understanding of the power of music in human life. Music already works for us on so many levels, whether it's soothing and teaching our infants, bringing people and communities together, adding spirit to our work and personal endeavors. But there is no reason to stop here. V2PT. Uh, as uh, Joanne pointed out, only one country, tiny little Bhutan, uh, wedged between uh, China and India, has adopted the gross national happiness as the uh, central uh, index of uh, government policy. 
and actually has had a good deal of success in education and in health and in economic growth and in environmental preservation. Uh, and they have a rather sophisticated way of measuring the effects of different policies on, the, on people's happiness. But they are the only country to go that far. But you're now beginning to get other countries interested enough to do kind of white paper policy analyses about whether uh, happiness research, uh, what effects would it have if we used it more for public policy. Uh, you're beginning to get uh, countries like Australia, France, Great Britain that are considering publishing regular statistics uh, on happiness. Uh, so it's beginning to become a, a subject of greater interest uh, for policymakers and legislators uh, in uh, different advanced countries. V2PT.